come with us now, if you dare, down a rickety staircase into a dank, dark basement. What awaits the Saturday Night Freak Show? <laughs> Hey, thanks for listening to the Saturday Night Freak Show podcast. We're a movie talk show and review podcast that comes your way every Saturday, whether you're ready for it or not, in our quest for total world domination. Hey, you can help us out with that by uh, hitting that like or subscribe button wherever you found us or give us a review. All of that stuff helps us uh, move up through the algorithms. Um, These are the Internet Radio Superstars. Michaela. Sean. And I'm Colin. Holly is on assignment tonight. Um, well, in memoriam, we want to tell you where you can find some of her favorite T-shirt designs. Michaela, why don't you tell in, folks? In memoriam, you're making it sound oh, like no. Holly died. <laughs> Holly. Yeah, if you're not on the show, you're you're dead. That's the only reason anybody would miss this. Uh, you go to tpublic.com slash user slash Saturday Freak Show. You can see all of our sweet merch. We've got a bunch of different designs to choose from. Lots of different things you can put them on. Public has sales all the time too, so go check it out. Yeah, everything's perpetually 35% off at that place. Yeah, there you go. Um, yeah, it's like a going out of business sale all the time over there. <laughs> yeah, it's a nice cheap marketing ploy. It's just like everything's always on sale. Like, well, so is it though? Yeah. So there you go. Catch a sale, wrap yourself in the Saturday night freak show. Uh tonight we watched a movie that was chosen by Sean. Sean, what did we watch tonight? <laughs> Uh, we watched from the year 1994, Wes Craven's New Nightmare. His new nightmare, not new nightmare. his old nightmare. It's got a brand new one. Okay, all right. Um, He's having nightmares again. Yeah. So, uh, how many how many Nightmare on Elm Street movies have we done on this show so far? Um, like w- one. The remake. Oh, we two. Did. Yeah, I forget. The remake doesn't count. <laughs> and then I part three. Yeah. I, yeah, I was going to say, I wasn't here for it, but I assume part three was done at some point. Yep, we didn't. Neither was I. So really, the only representation is part three and the new one. Well, I had to fix that. Um, <laughs> put a better taste in your mouth besides the one, the last one. that. We got. Well, we always so, yes. go off center. You never go with the, like the, you know, the classic. You always just no. shoot around the classic. Yeah. I'm surprised two hasn't been brought, though. For how much discussion always happens around two, just like in horror in general, you know, that's true. Like it's a relatively new thing, but who knows? I mean, that may end up. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, maybe we've conjured it now, Michaela. So, who I mean, knows? maybe I, I, I left it off because it was for a while. There was such a big thing, but I was just like, oh, I'm not going to go like right into the fire. And I we'll just we'll wait a little while. I'm sorry. Who talks about Wes Craven's new nightmare? We do. Damn it. Right we here do. on this show. Um, nobody else this is the first time ever it's been discussed <laughs> okay so um this so 1994 right so the nightmare on elm street yes. series ended in what year 1992 no thanks a lot <laughs> 1992 okay yep. it started in 84 <laughs> yeah can you believe uh this is from 1994 can you believe it's only a 10 year gap between that first movie and this movie yeah, that's got to be like one of the shortest. I mean, that's there were well, but the Friday the Thirteenth were on that same pace. Yeah, so, yeah, so I mean, those, Saw, Saw was on I mean, that yeah. pace, I think. Yeah, and that's Paranormal Activity. So you know, I know mm. the Insidious movies in. You know, they only got to four so far. And you know, I don't mm. know if they're on hiatus or they're done, but darn, yeah. only four <laughs> horror movies used to do that. You crank out the, uh, you know, pick a winner and stick with it and <laughs> just mm. keep cranking them out. So, it, uh, so Freddy's dead. It basically, uh, I mean, as like the title says, killed off the character of Freddy Krueger. Um, and uh, do you know how this particular film came about, Sean? I think. Mm, okay, well, I'll tell you. I don't. <laughs> so, um, Wes Craven for years had a uh, bone to pick with New Line Cinema. And this was, I think, because somehow the intellectual property rights of the Freddy Krueger character, right? Um, he didn't have any. I think for like the longest time, there was some arbitration, I believe. Um, I remember in an interview once he said that, um, you know, Sean Cunningham had told him that he's making a fortune off of these Friday, the 13th sequels. And Wes Craven was like, wait, what? 
uh, I'm not seeing anything off these Nightmare on Elm Street movies. And yeah. so he uh, was uh, engaged in negotiations, I think, for a long time with Robert Shea, trying to get some of the profit, you know, sharing or points, I guess, sure. uh, on the back end of those Nightmare on Elm Street sequels. And I think once they had, well, I mean, obviously he was involved in in uh, in Dream Warriors. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Didn't he have some? No, no. So, yeah, he was involved in Dream Warriors, co-written by, I believe. Yeah, he and uh, was it um, uh, not Bruce Joel Rubin? What was the guy's name? Bruce. Um, ah, damn it! The uh, guy wrote Map to the Stars and all. That. He uh, they co-wrote a script, um, which I think basically came up with the idea of the Dream Warriors and all that. You know, is people sharing dreams with each other. But then right. that was once um, Chuck Russell was brought on to direct that. He brought on Frank Darabont, and the two of them like completely threw out a lot of concepts and you know heavily reworked the uh the thing so it wasn't really Wes Craven's uh script that they went with um no for that from movie. what I hear he had um he had raised the idea of doing something similar to this for that movie but the studio like you said didn't like the idea and other people were brought in to rewrite it but this was around this was in Wes's head at least up and uh up to the point of Dream Warriors <laughs> Yeah, because I guess the, that was the thing, you know, at some point, you know, it was, uh, you know, even though they'd killed Freddy Krueger off, New Line Cinema, which was the studio that Freddy Krueger built. I mean, the profits mm -hmm. of those movies like made that, you know, we didn't have we wouldn't have Lord of the Rings if it wasn't for uh, <laughs> right? Freddy Krueger. They were so goddamn popular um, that they were like, you know, Wes, you got to come back and do another one. And so the way that I heard it, you know, he basically sat down and took a look at like all the other movies in the franchise and was like, okay, like, where do you go here as the, you know, how do you continue this storyline? And uh, his point, I don't know if you'd agree with this, but you know, he basically said if a, if a movie franchise is based off of its villain, then that means you really don't have a, a connective story that's going on. It's all basically going to be centered around like, well, in every new movie, you got to come up with a new cast of victims. You know, right. one of them has to be the hero who defeats your villain and you have to come and up with right. like another piece of ba hidden backstory, you know, about your villain. And that kind of becomes tiresome after a while where it's like, and now, you know, it's like this thing you didn't know about, you know, uh, right. Exactly and now, right. And, 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 and now there's, all there I was going to say, now there's nuns involved and now there's a whole bunch the backstory yeah. or the story of Freddy Krueger, like you said, is really they went out there a little bit over the years. He, he's exactly right. And those are all the reasons I don't like those movies. They are my least favorite franchise. I mm -hmm. will say that. It's, it's pretty weak. Really? It's pretty it, weak. I, I, well, let's see out of the big three. Uh, Halloween, uh, Friday the 13th and Nightmare on Elm Street. Nightmare on Elm Street is the third. And also, I uh, I think I've seen most of those movies about one time. Like Same. for me. Really? Yeah, yeah, I'm one and done with them. I cannot connect with this franchise the way everyone else seems to be able to. Oh wow, this I this yeah. shocks and surprises me. Well, I mean, I think, I, obviously, Colin, I think if you do the math of the number of good movies per franchise, this one comes out in third place. I agree with what Sean's saying. Oh, I don't know. See, I don't know if I I may disagree because I I I. Well, I mean, I'm just on a, on a corner where I think the Nightmare on Elm Street movies individually are probably. I don't know. Maybe you're right. Maybe I'll have to do some math. I was going to say that I think individually, like they are some, uh, they're better in some ways than a lot of like, I mean, for the Friday the 13th sequels, but I like the Friday the 13th sequels more, you know, I mean, I like that as right. a franchise more. I like the Halloween movies more, but like the Halloween movies have some of the worst, you know, like sequels and, you know, like their uh, plot was like, huh? Well, so it's the Friday the 13th. So maybe I think Nightmare on Elm Street almost maybe does have like a more coherent storyline. Um, I know it switches uh, central characters from like Nancy to uh, um, what was it? Alice, you know, uh, to Kristen right, to Alice, yeah. you know, but it's like, it does kind of keep on, uh, you can follow it at least through Freddy's dead. And then it was like, okay, this is, we're just making stuff up. But um, <laughs> I do think that there's, you know, as time goes on, I see less Freddy Krueger memes uh, you know, and, uh, it, it doesn't seem like the Freddy Krueger movies get as much, uh, love as like, you know, Michael Myers and, and Jason do. Um, yeah, I don't think they do either. If I, if I, I had to guess on one that would go by the wayside and 
first, I think it would be this series. Yeah. And I think that's because he becomes like MTV, like Wisecrack and Freddy so quickly in the franchise that like, that just isn't something people connect with. I don't think, you know? Hmm. Yeah. I think you had to live it yeah. to really be into it. Cause you know? clearly so. they did back then. That was, I mean, that was the distinguishing feature that made Freddy Krueger such a huge phenomenon was of the, of the slashers. He was the one with the personality, you know? Yeah. He, he, he was talked. Honked. Yeah. 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 He spoke and had a personality and, you know, I mean, Robert Englund comes across, you know, so it was like, there was an actor and a, you know, and a, and a creature or, you know, and a monster, um, instead of a guy in a mask. But, um, so, I mean, I, you know, you're saying 10 years, I mean, even what you guys are, are explaining that you're feeling right now at 10 years that had already set in. For the majority of the, you know, the, the box <laughs> yeah. office returns were dwindling. I think uh, four was a huge success, um, even though I don't think four is a particularly good movie, but it was based on the success of three, right? right. Three comes out. It's great. So everybody goes to see the next one the following year. And then Not I so think great. five, like nobody went to really see because four was was bad. I think even though it was a huge success and then uh, Freddy's dead was huge because it was like, this is we're going to you know be the send off. Right. When you get to that point where you're like, Freddy's dead, the final nightmare or uh, the final Friday. And when you those points, that's got that automatic draw on it. Like there's a conclusion. There's a, if that makes it an event. That's why those do so much better. Yeah. So Craven comes back on board, is able to negotiate his participation in the other films. So now he's going to, that's part of his involvement in this is contingent that he gets you know money from the other ones. And he sits down and goes like, well, what can we do? And so he started um, calling around. I think that was the, you know, his thing was always that Heather Langenkamp was his heroine. That was the character who beat Freddy Krueger. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, he brought her back, obviously. Like, so the sequel to his Nightmare on Elm Street is kind of Dream Warriors. That was the logical evolution of the um, Nancy character. It brought back, I think, in Nancy, you always have to have like her dad, John Saxon, has to yep. be involved in that. And that kind of concluded that story. That was like, you know, Nightmare One and Nightmare Two, as far as Wes Craven was concerned. And so he's like, okay, well, I got to, I got to bring them back in some capacity or make this about. Uh, Nancy, so it, is this our H two O? Is that is that our equivalent? Is that this is the only way I can my brain works? Is I have to equate it to another movie? <laughs> yeah, she's the Jamie Lee Curtis of the Nightmare on Elm Street uh, franchise. Right. So, but I guess, and this is the thing: like as he was, you know, having these phone calls with her, with Robert Shea, with um, you know, Robert Englund, um, you know, he he was finding out what they were doing in the in the intervening years. And a lot of the stuff that ends up working into this movie was like real life things. You know, she did have a stalker, apparently. Right. Um, that is true. Although it wasn't a Freddy Krueger stalker. Did you know that? No, it's just a regular stalker. <laughs> well, you know, just it was the, a, the garden variety one. It was a fan. The guy was a fan of uh, she was on a show called Just the Ten of Us. And apparently right. he was very upset that that show got canceled and became like, he started stalking her. I mean, weren't we all, I remember watching that. Yeah. Because she was in it. That's what, you know, but and nobody right. else knew that. Um, and she had had a child and she was married to a special effects guy. I think that's David Anderson in real life. And, uh, don't they have like a company? Um, yeah, yeah they a run pretty a successful pretty, one. pretty successful one. They've done a lot of work over the years. You've seen other stuff in like the new star Trek movies. Um, Heather Langenkamp's in that movie, dressed in, in garb and alien shit. But yeah, a pretty successful uh, effects company. Yeah, because they also did like Cabin in the Woods and they did uh, Dawn of the, right? the Zack Snyder, Dawn of the Dead uh, yep. movie. Um, so so Craven, we're pretty meta here. Yeah, but this is okay. But this is, I mean, I guess what you got to talk about is like, this is an out of the box fucking idea for a Nightmare on Elm Street sequel movie. And I mean, I give credit here to Wes Craven. Um, because, well, I don't know. I mean, maybe there was something in the, the zeitgeist because 1994 is also the same year that John Carpenter did in the mouth of madness. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that there's also some kind of fourth wall breaking stuff going on in that movie. Um, yeah. So do you think there was, uh, like more of an awareness among horror fans at this point? where they could pull off something like new nightmare 
and have it be successful because you got to, like you said, it's a risk because of the characters that are involving with this Bob Shea, Wes Craven, um, and making them their characters themselves. Do you think that they were noticing an uptick of like, um, uh, horror movie fans, like, I don't want to say getting smarter, but, um, getting to a point where they could pull off this story. Well, I mean, I don't think it's a risk at this point, considering there was like eight movies before this, you know, like it'd be a risk if it was your second or third movie for sure. But at this point, I don't think it's that much of a risk. But I mean, I think Wes Craven's just ahead of the curve because I mean, look at like he did Scream not long after this. And that was a bunch of self-aware, you know, characters and kind of fourth wall breaking, you know. So I think that was just something he had been wanting to do for a while and found a venue for it. Yeah. And I mean, granted scream was, uh, that was, you know, Kevin Williamson was the writer there, but it just, the, the fact that it landed on Wes Craven's desk, you know, for right. him to direct kind of put him in that. Cause yeah, it does seem like a uh, new nightmare is like a dry run in some ways for this kind of like, you know, um, it's the, they're meta movies, right. Where it's like, yeah. it's mo- yeah, scream is about horror fans being in a horror movie basically. Um, yeah, this if one, you look at it, actually, it's more of a um, it's more of a setup for Scream Two. I think there's more similarities between that movie and this movie than the actual first one. Yeah, because there's a movie being made about the movie. Um, <laughs> right. Yeah. Once we get into all that, I think like that's the bigger okay payoff from this movie. I wonder, and this is the the same thing. I think that in the mouth of madness, this is the, they have the same theme. Although I think maybe Night, New Nightmare is more successful at hitting it. Success, you know. Um, multiple times in the it's the idea because both of these guys carpenter and craven are um living through this period where every movie that they make gets criticized right is like you're making these horrible things and putting them out into society and there's unstable people out there right the horror audience who lap right. this stuff up and then they turn around and they do shit in the real world that's inspired by the characters that you create and so you know, because I think there were obviously, you know, people who would build, you know, Freddy Krueger gloves and attack their sisters or, you know, do something, <laughs> you know, right. uh, people getting injured or possibly, you know, I don't know if there were, uh, you know, real life murder scenarios with guys with their razor blades and all that stuff. But it's the idea that the creator is actually sitting there thinking about like, am I actually does horror movie, cor- do horror movies corrupt the audience right right um do you think they do colin i mean because that's kind of that's what this movie is like point blank asking at one point is it i mean well, it's well, it asks it's, it's it in, oh definitely yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. but what, whatever the answer is i mean i believe it's up to us but it's definitely like going in that direction and asking that question well, i don't think so he do leaves you, it do up to think? us i think he has the answer in the in the movie what's the movie well about? i mean well well it's the obviously they it's the power of it the movie is um um uh, well the movie is to me uh it, it's it's about the power of storytelling um and and what that can do what the hell was that um what was your question <laughs> i think that this movie is actually like secretly a horror movie for like working actors because it's the idea of like you do one thing in your career and it's always going to come back and you're never going to be able to get out of that shadow. That is what you are going to be known for, whether you like it or not. So learn to deal with it. Yeah. Yeah. How many working actors do you think saw this movie and just groaned? <laughs> well, it's all, I mean, it, it, it's like it's it's working on multiple levels, right? Where it's also like a behind many. the scenes. It's like a Hollywood movie, you know, like yeah. the behind the scenes making of, you know, kind of. Um, Oh yeah, we we're getting the behind the scenes of everything in here. I, I love a good uh, I love a good behind the scenes Hollywood movie. Yeah, but I think his his thesis, the answer that Craven has for that question, is that in human psychology, right, there is an evil, right, that we're all we all have within us. And I think to him, I believe that he thinks that stories, maybe movies specifically in this case, but as you were saying, storytelling. Mm-hmm. Um, somehow and you've heard this before that horror movies are like boot camp for the psyche or whatever so you you know you experience horrible things and you're not doing them in real life or it's an outlet for aggressive um you know or whatever fear 
you know, well, you know an outlet for fear. Yes. Yeah. It's it can, a, a release of it. If you yeah. Will. And so his theory here is that somehow like in this specific case, this unnameable thing, which is, I guess, personified as a demon has mm -hmm. been contained in the storytelling of the nightmare on Elm street movie series. And it likes being Freddy Krueger because it's the most popular. And once they stop making the movies, then he's saying, well, then, then, you know, if you don't make horror movies, then you risk this thing coming into real life, <laughs> you right. know, spilling over into reality. And that's basically what the movie's about, right? It's like, right. well, we got to make yep. another movie to contain, you know, to, to, or at least to give that outlet so it doesn't become a hazard to the real people uh, involved in the making of the movie. Right. And I, I, I like this uh, view of the movie because I think anybody who's a fan of movies, I think kind of like deep down, they they believe the stuff like the power of these stories to contain these things. Like, I love this idea that he comes up with for this because somewhere deep down, like I want to believe it. Like I'm in it. Like I'm, it's fun, but it's fun too. Not out of some sort of like, I'm, I'm, I'm still have my grasp on reality and I know these things aren't real, but it's, it's fun to imagine that. I mean, stories have power to begin with, but to actually have a power to contain something like this, I, I, it builds a good mythology for like horror movies in general, but for, I mean, Freddy Krueger as well. I, I love this idea. And he works in uh, even like classic, uh, you know, cause I mean, basically there's a foundation. I, I thought it was kind of interesting that he pins a lot of this on Hansel and Gretel. Mm. Right. Where in that yeah. version of the story, Freddy Krueger is basically the witch and the kids are going to, beat the witch by throwing it in the, you know, the fire in its house or whatever. Once you're caught by the, the witch and kind of, I'm like, this is a, it's a, that's a clever idea, you know, <laughs> to kind of hang your movie on that. Um, right. Okay. So as we said, uh, Heather Langenkamp is back. How do we, how are we introduced to uh, the fictionalized Heather Langenkamp in this, in this movie? Well, what better way than on a Freddy Krueger set, Collins? I mean, we come in and we're in the middle of what we start off with. Uh, do we know what we don't know? It's a movie right at the beginning. Do we know not until they yell cut? We start out in that um, in Freddy's lair as he's creating a new mechanical glove and a live mechanical glove, as it were. Um, and so he's going through the motions of creating it. And then he reaches for the big butcher knife and cuts off his own hand to put on the new glove. And that's when we hear uh, Wes Craven giving directions in the background. So we figure out we're on a movie set and then we kind of go from there. We're introduced to characters. I mean, we all should know at this point, we got uh, Wes Craven, Heather Langenkamp playing themselves on a set and our visual effects guys messing with our new Freddy glove. There was also a, uh, there's there, they also work in like a real life uh, earthquake. Um, wasn't there like, they, I, cause I think they, at some point they drove around and got some uh, footage of like the wreckage of the earthquake, but it, they play it into the plot, right? That the earthquake right, yeah. is kind of the, like a thing that signifies that, you know, reality is starting to, uh, to buckle. Right. Yeah. Maybe even marriage. Yeah. Um, yeah, because I think we were asking, like, when was the last time that lost? And this is where, you know, somebody's going to Google this. And like, we, it happened just last year. But like, when was the last time there was a big Los Angeles earthquake? <laughs> I mean, what are we looking for, like, freeways falling down? Cause yeah, well, this one was big enough to also inspire Escape from L.A., right? And it wasn't, uh, isn't that like yeah. somewhere around this? Yeah. Yeah, this was, yeah, this was a big earthquake that they, I think it happened like two weeks um, just before the end of production or something like that. After they shot all their own earthquake stuff then an actual earthquake happened so yeah they sent the film crew around to go pick up some shots okay okay so um the quote-unquote real life feather langen camp uh so she's got a, a a son played by the actor michael hughes um anyone who was watching movies in the 1990s has seen this kid am i right or TV yeah. even he's been he pops up fucking everywhere. You can't avoid this kid. Is yeah, he still at working? Cemetery, this movie, oh, Full House. Yeah. Oh no, it's all right. But yeah, I, he, he was uh, a noticeable kid 
Yeah, I checked his IMDb. He's got a few like indie movies the past few years, but that's about it. Yeah, I know he's been doing like the convention circuit, but I mean, isn't he yep. also famously the uh, boys have a penis and girls have a vagina? Yep. Kid from Kindergarten Cop. <laughs> there yes. is. Uh, he was in Spawn. I mean, he was all over the place. Oh yeah, Spawn. Yeah, he was in everything. Yeah. Um, what a fun childhood to like be on movie sets for most of your young childhood. Yeah, but like all like scary horror movie stuff, right? <laughs> all that stuff, you know, like what, are you are you see, okay, Michael? I may be we, set we, for life, but you know, it was weird to right. look and see he was like just a few years older than me. Oh, okay. Sorry, I just kind of noticed there. Uh, yeah, is he? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and now he's like, like, he's, like he's like four years older than me. Oh, wow. Yeah, I thought that was weird because you know you don't you don't think about like how time shifts when you watch movies like that. You know, I was just like, oh whoa, because like I don't know. I guess I expected him to be a lot older for some reason. Right. And I saw I saw his like Instagram profile while we were watching because I was like, what is he up to now? And yeah, the convention circuit. But it's interesting because like when you go to horror conventions, everyone's from like movies from the seventies and eighties, so they're quite a bit older. And then there's just him who's like my age, just hanging out at tables too, you know? Right. The young gun, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. If you think about it, this was 94, I was eight. I mean, come on. So right there at the same age as this kid. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like, if, uh, you know, the things would have worked out a little different, it could have been you. Uh, right uh, i mean uh, you know it's gonna end up being my kid who looks just like nico hughes (laughs) funny enough no he'll be the actor well so the kid uh dylan is his name in the movie so he's basically the conduit then right for uh for this uh dream demon thing to try and start making contact yeah because wes uh heather has a sit down with wes at some point and wes says he's going to if freddie's going to come into this world to get you. He's going to attack you at your most vulnerable points. And that would be her son and her husband, uh, Dylan. And what's his husband's name? Chase. And husband. Chase. And husband. And Chase. Right. Yeah, right. Because his, his visual effects company is cut to the chase. Cut to the chase effects. effects. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, um, so why, what, what would, why does the Freddy Krueger, whatever, Freddy demon, uh, want like, uh, to come back and confront Heather Langenkamp. I think because it's uh, like uh, Wes says in the movie, there's a few reasons that the quote unquote genie can come out of the bottle. Um, I think his, in the movie, I don't think his popularity has waned, but they're not making any more movies and Freddie's not happy or the demon is not happy about it. Um, and so he, if they're not going to make movies, then he wants it. <laughs> yeah. And he's got to kill her basically. Right. To do it. Right. Cause otherwise like she's the one thing, uh, standing between him and like domination, like coming out and not being stopped. So he's got to go through his first nemesis, Heather. Yeah. To me, that idea would work a lot better if Heather Langenkamp had been like a Laurie Strode and had been like throughout the franchise more, you know? Uh, like it would just be a stronger concept if that was the case. Yeah. I think well, it's uh, because West in Wes Craven's mind, there were only two other movies. He was like, ah, well, fuck those sequels. <laughs> well, see, like, for me, that's it, too. <laughs> and that's why she works in this movie, because Nightmare on Elm Street is Heather to me. Yeah. Like, I, I, I that's what I'm most familiar with. No, I agree. I'm just saying that's not what the franchise says, though. Right. Like, she becomes right. unimportant to this franchise so quickly, you know? So but, she's not on a Laurie Strode level in that sense. No. Yeah. I, well, I think, uh, you know, the irony is I think you can watch uh, Nightmare 1, 3, and 7, and basically that that is like the arc, you know? It's like you only need those three movies, and you can disregard all the other ones. Colin um, said it first. That's all you need. <laughs> disregard the rest. Colin, you're proving our point about Colin, the math not working out. Yeah. Well, no, whether or not they're good movies or not, it's like, well, I get some affection for some of the things that they do. And, well, and right. some of those, you know, they're fun even, movies. Even movies you don't particularly like still have some good stuff in it. Yeah. But yeah. but not enough to get me to rewatch it though, Sean. Like I'm it has you, a, like I've yeah. seen them all like once. You know, there's I'll watch that first one whenever. That's great. Um, but yeah, the other ones like I haven't had a draw to get back to them. Yeah. Well, maybe well, maybe right. they're due for a rewatch. You got to go for your eight film maybe. Uh, Nightmare on Elm Street or what eight, including uh, Freddy versus Jason, right? I mean, I've got that. Yeah. Um, 
Well, Robert Englund also does show up in the movie as himself. There's uh, early on in the movie, we're setting up like, I mean, there's a, because I, I was thinking about it, the first 20 minutes is a pretty like decent economy of storytelling where it sets up that there's, uh, you know, earthquakes are happening and that's kind of got everybody shaken and rattled. She's getting phone calls from a stalker who's pretending to be Freddy Krueger. And so she's concerned about her family. There's a moment where she meets Robert England again. It's at like a, a TV talk show uh, thing that's, you know, going on interview and they surprise her by bringing out Robert England in full Freddy uh, you know, makeup, but he's mm. playing the Freddy Krueger that you've seen in the other movies, you know, uh, playing right. up to the audience and all that stuff. But there was a moment where the guy asks her like, you know, Oh, you've got a kid now. What's his name? And you can just see it on her face that, you know, she's aware that, you know, I'm giving more of myself, you know, uh, my private right. life out to these potential crazy horror fans. I guess that's what they are saying is that, you know, it's like, well, that you do have uh horror fans who are, you know, overly enthusiastic ravenous. yeah <laughs> yes they're, they're, i mean they're in that crowd they're ravenous for freddy at that point because they're in the crowd of the talk show taping they're all dressed up they've got signs for them it's a craze yeah i, I want to live in this world you know like <laughs> i want to live in this world where like this is like prime television heather langenkamp is an is an a-list celebrity that has a fucking driver and people recognize her in public i want to live in this world you know, I think that, that, yeah, that did happen. And probably around the time of this movie, I mean, they, well, I mean, I think people get picked up and taken, driven to, uh, you know, their, their interview, uh, dates or whatever that they have on shows. But I think you probably would have seen an audience like that. If Freddy Krueger showed up on, you know, um, I don't know, the Arsenio Hall show or, right, uh, yeah. uh, Regis and, uh, not Regis and Kelly, who was, uh, Kathy Lee. Kathy Lee, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know, but I want that to be sustainable. I don't want yeah. that just to be because it's this one movie came out. You know what I'm saying? Like, Heather Langenkamp was never an A-list celebrity. She was never a household name. Like, this movie posits she is, you know? People recognize her all the time in this movie. They're like, oh, you're from that Freddy movie. That does not happen. I've met her in person. It does not happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, she went, I mean, I don't know. Well, it, yeah. I don't no, know if they know. the convention circuit. That's how I met her. <laughs> She's yeah. not an A-list celebrity. I think she's not. I mean, she's not A-list, but she is, as far as Nightmare on Elm Street is concerned, like she's A-list there. Yeah. Well, so yeah, the horror but of the, but that's all that matters. Takes yeah. this to it. This movie's like, no, she's A-list in the, the world, like of celebrity. She is A-list. Right, but well, even she says like, she's not a star fantasy. in the in the movie. Right. But I think what I'm saying is the, the way fantasy. people react to her, though. Like People recognize her from A Nightmare on Elm Street in this movie constantly. Yeah. That does not happen to her in real life. I guarantee it. Right. But I bet that's what they're they're banking on in doing that in this movie. Um, from a like a fan's perspective, I think. Well, she uh, ends up uh, they also, you know, she's got. So obviously there's something going on with Dylan, the kid. Um, yeah. And uh, he starts to be, I don't know if they're trying to say that he's possessed by Freddy Krueger. He's always standing around being a creepy kid. He's watching Nightmare on Elm Street on the, uh, you know, on, on TV. unplugged TVs. Yeah. Yeah. And then he's talking like Freddy Krueger and he's just behaving all kind of weird. Um, they set up a thing where he's dependent on, he's not sleeping, I guess. Right. This is part of what's going on with him. He uh, has a little stuffed, uh, dinosaur t-rex named rex who guards the foot of his bed um i thought that was a cute scene where you know he's like showing mom after they read hansel and gretel he's like you know down there is the bad man at the bottom of my bed you know and so rex stands there and he protects me and uh yeah it just went on for way too long this movie has no business being two two hours long there's absolutely no reason for it 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 does I will say this, this movie does take its time. Like I, it's definitely not in any rush to get anywhere, but, and while that I, I, you know, I understand how, you know, it can seem long. I think I like that they put that into this movie. I think it pays off at the end. Um, yeah, it is. Yeah. It's an hour and 53 minutes, but I like that they're doing, I like the storytelling that they're going with. And I think it, we get there once we get to the end. Yeah. I mean, I thought that the, the stuff with the kid being weird was uh repetitive and then eventually you yes. get, you know, um, you know, if you were going to go like, well, what would you trim out of the movie to make it shorter? 
because I do agree that I think it could have been a little bit shorter, but I mean, it didn't bother me that it, of the length that it was, but just at some point in a nightmare on Elm street movie, you're going to have those dream sequences where you can't tell if it's like, you know, actually happening or not. And so it seems like you're seeing the same scene several times. How many times is that yes. kid going to get up in the middle of the night, wander around and do something yeah. creepy? You know, I agree. Yeah, yeah I, agree. <laughs> I agree with you too, that. Yeah. Those, especially you could cut out one of those, one of those child moments, I think at least. Right. Like, and then you'd be fine. Well, and the dream sequences, especially like when it gets to the hospital towards the end are super short, like they start and then it immediately gets weird. There's none of this like, am I in a dream? Am I in reality? Slowly ramp up to the weirdness. It just immediately flips the switch. I, I do like that, though, because you can kind of if you watch it, you can you can see where they dip in. Like, I think they're playing. I think Wes is playing a straight game in this where when people you find out people have fallen asleep at some point where you can't, uh, it's not obvious that they have fallen asleep, but I think if you watch it, you can see at a point, you know, where, uh, where the character would have fallen asleep at that point. And he's see, doing, I, I think don't want to see that though. I want right, right. to be surprised. You know what I'm saying? Right. And I felt like they really telegraphed it every time in this movie, you know, really well, it does this, yeah. it does this thing that I thought was different than the, the prior, uh, you know, his prior nightmare on Elm street movie where this time, uh, he errs on the side of the shock effect where, you know, it's like someone's, you know, maybe going to be falling asleep. And then as soon as they do, like the, the shit hits the fan, like immediately there's like voices right. coming out or Freddie shows up or, you know, something. And it's there's like, no Jesus, suspense. you know? Yeah. But it, it, it's, I think he did that the first time around. So he's trying to do something different, whether or not, you know, it worked is up to you, but, um, it's it he's going for shock you know it's like boom you're in a dream and something shocking happens um part of i think his um you know reason for wanting to do this was you know he didn't like the jokey uh freddy krueger um you know the mtv freddy basically yeah um so his whole thing was like okay i'm gonna reclaim freddy and bring him you know make him scary again and how do you do that and so you know, this shock effect thing. And there's a lot of, they actually, the, the character of Freddy Krueger in this movie, I looked at it, it was like an hour and six minutes before he actually shows up in a nightmare on Elm street movie, which I thought was kind of ballsy, but I didn't like <laughs> miss it. You know, well, I guess I missed him enough to go like, Hey, you're like, how long have we been watching this? Um, there's a build like this massive yes. build to like, when is this thing that you're talking about? This Freddy character going to actually show up again. And when he does, when he busts out of the closet, you know, really, and like miss me, which was a trailer moment, you know, right? Um, well, I mean, he's in the grave, I think, before that, but you well, barely yeah, get to say, see him. We are, we they're doing it again, like they said, they're playing the long game where they're peppering him in throughout because we do get him in the casket, we do get the phone calls, which is you know Freddie's voice, um, and I think there's a couple other things, like I think we get the telephone gag again, um. But I, it's little moments throughout before we get, yeah, full on Freddy. But yes, they are being ballsy by holding him back and putting the other characters out front first, Wes and Heather and all that. Okay. Well, then a question for you. So if, if Craven's um, in idea is I'm going to make a dark and scary Freddy, right? So mm -hmm. for the folks who haven't seen this movie who are listening to it, I was wondering if you could do two things. Tell me what they have done to change Freddy. And, uh, you know, is this, uh, it, was he successful at it? done to change freddy well they've made him obviously they've made him less jokey uh we get a whole new look well a whole new look we get a new look to freddy in this one uh, a nice upgrade i would say uh, oh i think he looks like a power rangers <laughs> villain dude that face oh, really is so solid and does not move like it's so sculpted and like it there's is. no like rubbery texture to it anymore it just looks like one big piece they put over robert england's head and but I am more bothered by the contacts than that. The contacts are fucking terrible in this movie. Holy shit. Yeah. I don't know personally if I like Freddy Krueger with contacts, they carry that over to Freddy versus Jason where it's like an, right. that's like an amalgamation of like the after new nightmare, like an evolution that where he's got pointed teeth. I'm like, no, just yeah. stop. Go back. Right. You know, like the contacts are so <laughs> distracting, man. They, they're, they're crazy looking. I'm really not a fan of those. <laughs> Well, it's definitely a different look and they upgrade his, um, we get him a trench coat and his, uh, I 
and maybe a different fedora, but his fedora is there. He's still and wearing the black. red and green sweater, but yeah, it's underneath this big black flowing trench coat and he's got big black boots. So it's like, you know, I don't know. They're, and it looked like they padded him up maybe. So Robert Englund looks, you know, cause he's maybe. like a skinny guy, but in this, he yeah. looks like this big, you know, um, he's like bulkier. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they've also done alterations to his voice, especially in the 5.1 mix with your su- subwoofer. Every single time he talks, there's a sub, you know, um, <laughs> subsonic register. You? Yeah. Well, I'm like, oh, uh, that's different than oh, before. I can seal you, Robert. Yeah. Um, the glove has also been uh, retinkered with. Um, what I think they were after is, um, I think there was a guy named Matthew Knight who created the original poster for A Nightmare on Elm Street. It's a great piece of art, you know, if you've seen it. And he, I don't know if he'd seen the movie when he drew this. Uh, That's the only thing I could think <laughs> is that he just, you know, a guy with the razors for fingers. And so he made this like, you know, it's like bones with the knives like built into the bones coming out of them in that poster. And it seems like, and that was also carried over to the, uh, uh, the, the number two and the number three posters. I think they all use I, that sinewy bone and sinew and knife, uh, you know, hand. I think that's right. what they were trying to recreate and give him in this movie. Yes. Um, uh, yeah. They, they're doing that um, to uh, what do you think uh, to what if, I mean, they also add another blade to his thumb in this one. So it's it's reworked. Um, I like the evolution of it. I mean, the, the glove is, you know, classic, obviously. But again, we're, we're doing different stuff in this movie where we're altering things. Um, Freddy's, you know, just a little bit different in this. Um, I like the glove. I think it, you know, I, I like what they were going for with it. I like the sinewy kind of bony. It seems more natural to Freddy, like he was born with this thing, mm-hmm. which is which this entity, it works for this entity. So, I, I mean, I'm down for it. Yeah, as much as I have issues with like the, the face makeup and the, and the context, like the rest of it, I'm pretty OK with. And I guess if you consider coming off of like Super Freddy, like this is definitely a huge improvement. So forgot, I'll give a point for Super that Freddy. for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Super Freddy. Yeah, that was from number five, right? The uh, the Dream Child. I couldn't tell you. Yeah. Okay. I know it's from yeah. one of them. <laughs> yeah. Um. So the things that happen uh, leading up to the appearance of Freddy Krueger, uh, Heather Langenkamp's husband is killed by Freddy Krueger apparently while he's driving home, and this. Uh, but he's mangled in a car accident. So you know everybody thinks, well, he just died in a car accident. This is tragic. But she's like, no, he's been. He's got you know four slashes uh, on his chest. So clearly this was Freddy Krueger. She begins thinking that this is going on with all the shit that's you know happening with her kid. Talk like freddy there's something happening here and wes craven it turns out wants her to be in a new movie or at least new line cinema does i like the fact that there is a scene that takes place in the offices of new line cinema uh yeah. with with bob shea who's That's not an great. actor no <laughs> clearly bob not shea is not an actor <laughs> and like before he was relegated to you know very obvious cameo appearances which was fine but this this is too much dialogue for this man like he he clearly needs some help with it yeah, I think his next biggest role was probably in Freddy versus Jason, right? Doesn't he play like the admin? He plays like a principal or something in in that movie. I think um, so. But would you be surprised? MF probably. Mad, the keeper of the Saturday Night Freak Show Wall of Fame, says that we have now inducted Robert Shea as an actor onto wow. the Saturday Night Freak Show Wall of Fame because of his appearances in New Nightmare and also The Hidden. Where he oh, played man right. in silver Mercedes picking up a gorgeous girl, and he was also in Man's Best Friend as a mechanic. All New Line Cinema movies. Oh were, yeah, yeah, yep. of course. The Shays well. work themselves in. Of course, Lynn Shay, the future star, superstar. She's a horror superstar of her own now. Uh, from all those, uh, I keep saying the Insidious movies. I know she was in those, but she's been in like everything, right? Everything. In the past, yeah, like, she's the, <laughs> yeah, she's the new. We need a. She's the new. We need a scary older lady. Yeah. And she's the go to. Yeah. For a long time, including uh, Colin's favorite movie of the year, The Grudge. That's right. Um, she was in The Grudge. You're correct. Yes, yes, yes. And I don't know if, uh, I don't think A Nightmare on Elm Street was her first movie. She was the teacher in, in that oh, no. movie. She's, uh, uh, what year was that? Um, I'm trying to think what year Critters was. God damn it. That was 86. Uh, 86. Okay. Yeah. No, nah, I couldn't have been her first. Maybe it was Nightmare on Elm Street. All right, who knows? Maybe, huh? Um, so, um, 
So after the husband is killed, and then that kind of brings um, every all the. So we have the Nightmare on Elm Street funeral scene, uh, which is you know like a pre. So this is like a Nightmare on Elm Street movie. It's just like operating weird. Um, yeah. Where we get to see Nick Corey, who was in the original Nightmare on Elm Street movie. He's there Tuesday night from right. number four. Is there? Uh, Robert Englund's obviously there, and John Saxon shows up. Um, and uh, of course, the infamous story of of Johnny Depp not being like this was the scene Johnny Depp would have been in had Wes Craven had the courage to ask him to be in the movie. Yeah, did you hear about that? 1994 Johnny Depp, no way he's fucking doing this. No he way. Said he, he said he would have. He said he would have. It, it's he always said, easy to say you would have after the fact. Right, obviously, yes. Yeah, that was... Like, a, well, this is like peak of his career. Like, I really don't think he'd give this the time of day. You what know? if I told you that Johnny Depp had a cameo appearance in Freddy's Dead in 1992? He did that one. That, that makes me think even more reason for him to turn down this one. You know, I already did it once. I'm not doing it again. <laughs> He'd do it. Come on. Yeah, he was on like a TV or something in that. Uh, oh, yeah, that's, that's on that's TV. TV. Isn't, okay. talk, isn't this, your, this is your brain on drugs? Your brain on TV drugs. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, Wes Craven said that he was too timid to actually ask superstar Johnny Depp. And later when he ran into him, Johnny Depp said, sure, I would have done, done it. But um, so... Uh, John Saxon basically then becomes like, uh, cause I was kind of, I liked the, the way that the movie did this. It like brought John Saxon in as like the confidant of yeah. uh, Heather Langenkamp, you know, like they're friends off, off screen also. You right. Know? Like after playing with father and daughter, they like, they bonded and now they're just friends in real life. It's kind of nice. Yeah. It's a good, and plus it's a good way to bring in, you know, other characters from that, especially John Saxon. Um, Ooh, we since- should say rest in peace, John Saxon. The Academy may have forgotten we have not. That's right. We didn't. The freak show. We have not. Has not forgotten. That's right. We appreciate the long storied career of John Saxon, where that guy was in the, the Mario Bava movie, the first Giallo ever made, The Girl Who Knew Too Much in like 1967. He was basically, I think, right? At some point, they wanted him to be the next Burt Reynolds. He was in like a bunch of uh, <laughs> like exploitation movies. He was in Italian movies. He was in Enter the Dragon with Bruce Lee because he knew karate. He was in all sorts yeah. of Black Christmas and Nightmare on Elm Street will be the way that we probably always remember. Yeah, him. not good enough for the Academy to put him in the in memoriam. I know. I guess not. I mean, since since the last time I watched this movie, I had my respect for John Saxon has grown immensely. Like seeing all the stuff that he has been in. Yeah. Holy shit. Yeah. The guy did a lot. I had no idea. But he has done a lot. Yeah. A lot of good say. You got to go back and check out the filmography of John Saxon. May he rest. Uh, you'll be, you'll be surprised. Was the last thing that he well, like, what would have been on our radar? Was that from dusk till dawn? He had like a brief, he was a police and, uh, you know, like an FBI guy or something. And then like, we're going to get you. I don't, get even, brothers. I don't even remember that. It's one scene in the movie. Oh yeah. man. Um, so, um, because Heather tells the kid that daddy's in heaven, the kid at a playground when they're, she's sitting there with John Saxon saying all this weird shit's happening. The kid climbs to the top of a uh, play like it's like a space rocket playground equipment thing. It stands up there and freaks everybody out. And this is where we start to go like, well, you know, are we dealing with a mental illness or is there actually a supernatural component happening here? And then this right. was like, you know, is this like a, a real life thing? I don't know, but there's a big deal made about, you know, Heather Langenkamp says that there's mental illness runs in her family and she becomes afraid that she's passed on some kind of hereditary um, issue to her son. Um, yeah. This kind of seemed like a, this seemed like a weird ad. To the movie, because I, you know, unless you're, I think you're, unless you're aware of what the mental illness is in Heather's family, I don't think it makes for a very strong storyline. I don't know. I thought it was weird that she was talking about passing a madness on to, um, onto Dylan when we haven't heretofore like seen that madness. It's weird. Right. Yeah. But I guess it's the only way that they can kind of explain away from like a real world scenario because what they're going to go with, right? What, what Craven's going with is that sleep deprivation causes the same kind of schizophrenic behavior um or it can be misdiagnosed as schizophrenia mm-hmm. if but it's actually sleep deprivation because dylan's been keeping himself awake and then means that he ends up getting admitted to a hospital and this begins like this second part of the movie it seems like where 
Heather Langenkamp becomes more convinced that this Freddy Krueger thing is real. I think at some point in there, she actually does encounter Freddy in her bedroom. Uh, you know, when he's like, hey, you know, miss me is getting his power back or whatever. And, yeah. um, but the kids basically being held captive at the, um, at the hospital where there's a nurse ratchet type character who I thought she was basically voicing the critic opinion of horror movies, right? She's the voice the the critic or like the PTC the parents te- the parent teacher council and stuff like that the people who are like horror movies they will rot your brain and make you do violent things like she's yeah she's definitely a stand in for that group yeah. because she keeps asking like constantly even the first thing one of the first things she asks Heather is like you haven't let him watch your films have you like yeah. she's very concerned about it and then when the kid starts talking about Freddy Krueger then she's like you have let him him watch your films good day miss lang you know it's a very she's morally <laughs> right. indignant she's that character day. yeah you're not yeah, a good yeah, parent yeah. because you let your kid watch horror films you know god damn it <laughs> um you shut up lady yeah and her of course you know what method of treatment is to uh you know we're going to drug the kid up and make him sleep cuz that's what he needs he just needs to sleep and that'll you know Kira, um, there's a scene in here where uh, there's a babysitter character or a nanny um, named Tracy who um, has been throughout oh, the yeah. film, but um, she's there when Freddy Krueger actually shows up. Uh, I guess what happens is Dylan is uh, given a bunch of sleeping medication. So his uh, dream becomes basically a reality uh, yes. and Freddy Krueger is actually able to show up and then they pull off a scene that's uh, a mirror of the original Nightmare on Elm Street revolving room um, Mm -hmm. where Tina being dragged up the wall this time. It's Tracy. There were a lot of callbacks and stuff like that and dialogue and uh, to all the other Nightmare on Elm Street movies, Um, you know, references to can you come into my dream with me? And I think that only happens in the movies, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, There was a scene in here that uh, I got to tell you, I was not happy with uh, then and still I'm not happy with now. And that's the crossing the freeway scene. (laughs) <laughs> all right let's let's break this down colin why are you unhappy with the scene um 1994 is computer graphics uh, <laughs> can you continue see the dark outlines of the composites in this and everything like can you see who's real and who's not yeah it's pretty it's pretty egregiously bad watching it now but it also i mean i get the idea of it right the kid's gonna go home he's escaped he's sleepwalking he's still dreaming and so in his dream he is seeing you know, Freddy Krueger in the clouds and a hundred Freddy's walking up on them uh, over the hill. And so there's, you know, cars, you know, it's a big like action scene in the middle of the movie, but at some point cloud Freddy's like picking him up by, you know, his, uh, his pinky finger uh, knife, you know, by the, by the shirt collar and like dangling him in front of cars. And in those scenes, I always kind of go like, well, what objectively is happening here? You know? Right. A kid, a kid is just being dangled by nothing in front of traffic on a freeway. That's it. Yeah. And a crazy lady is running through traffic to try and get him. Yeah. Yeah. You think anybody would stop at some point if you just saw a kid levitating in the middle of the night? Do you even see that? Weird. I don't know. Ellie, Ellie drivers, man. I don't think think it looks good, but I still stand by that. I think all the CGI in this movie looks better than anything in the remake still. <laughs> this like, is very true. And that remake had what, like 15 years on this movie to figure shit out. And probably and a much bigger, yeah, triple the budget yeah. or something oh, like that. Yeah. yeah, too. yeah. yeah. So. yeah I'll, t- I'll, t- I'll take any uh, uh, Heather Langenkamp ducking under a jackknifing truck over anything that was in that new movie. Yeah. Um, Cloud Freddy. But this ends up what it serves to do is it gets all of our characters back to the house, at which point reality does actually kind of shift. And this becomes a night round Elm street seven. Uh, uh, yeah. I love, I love this crossover because we end up back. Heather has called John Saxon, the confidant because she needs help because Dylan is on the loose. They, she eventually ends up back at her house. Dylan's there. John's there. And then we slowly get a turn into a universe we get John Saxon. You start hearing him call Heather Nancy for some reason. The first That's time odd. he did that, it's like offhand and you may not even catch it. Yes. And that gives me chills on... when I saw that in the theater. I was like, ooh, shit. You know, like... Right? Because he's, he's, he's just kind of like you could see a little bit of him on screen and you hear it and she's talking too. So you don't, maybe you didn't catch it. But then he just keeps calling her Nancy. 
and Freddy has shown up in Dylan's bed. He's come up through the covers and I love, he rips the hole and he just waits for it. I love this scene because he's sitting there and he's waiting to see if Nancy is going to play his game. Yeah. And she does. And she gives into it. She says, I love you, daddy to John Saxon as he's transformed um, into his character from the first film. Uh, he's the police officer. Yeah, Lieutenant and she Johnson, accepts it yeah. and she goes with it. And then he's out and coming for her. I love that scene. Yeah. And I also like the, uh, I thought it was clever. The method that, you know, to, to find Dylan, who's been taken by Freddie, uh, she's following the breadcrumbs like in Hansel and Gretel and it's the sleeping pills and they lead into his bed and she's like, well, what the hell? But you have to actually put the covers on the bed and then crawl in. And then that becomes like a tunnel that leads to like a subterranean, you know, it's like a slide <laughs> that takes you down mm-hmm. in the subterranean Freddy layer. Um, so, I mean, I guess that's the thing here. Um, Freddy Krueger doesn't have a whole lot of screen time in this movie. Um, and so this is the big climactic, um, you know, moment. Uh, what'd you think of, uh, I mean, like, what are we, what are we going for here with this, uh, well, what, what about the set? I mean, what does Freddy Krueger's lair look like? Why does it always have to be weird castle dungeons with him? Why? I don't, like, it's a dream. It can be whatever the fuck it wants, but I feel like it's always the same. I think that's the point. I think that's what the demon likes. Like He likes that atmosphere. He likes bringing victims into that area to torture them. I think, I, it's, I think it's perfect for him. Well, I think I, he thinks it's perfect for him. I just wish these movies would get weirder sometimes, you know, like <laughs> you can do whatever the fuck you want and you keep retreading the same territory. That's your previous five movies. You want yeah. some weirder? Go watch. No, yeah, I have I seen those, but like, I don't, I mean like environmentally weirder, not necessarily like the nuns and all that shit and the mm. dream child. Like, like, I mean, if you think about the, some of the weird dreams you've had, you know, it's not always like a logical structure that makes sense. Or, you know, get some MC Escher building shit going on here, you know? No, they, no, do, no, that, they do that in five. <laughs> they do that in five. Yeah, but there's always like the Wes Craven dreams. Um, his is always like, you know, because there is like that bleed. Usually like you're in your house in your basement. And there's one thing that's like out of place and you open it and it turns out there's a subterranean you know, like stairway in your basement that, you know, like a dream. It's just like, the, you know, and then you end up in, in Freddy's boiler room or something like yeah. that. So it just keeps changing or there's the goats castle. in your boiler room for some dumb reason. You know, because it's a dream. <laughs> um, right. This one takes that kind of boiler room, subterranean basement dungeon imagery, but also is kind of grafting like he lives in like the Acropolis. I think this was because there's all these, you know, like, I don't know if you Alan- call them Greek pillars and stuff like that this is what's probably below uh robert england's house yeah yeah because like this yeah. would make this would make sense <laughs> uh, over, underneath robert england's spanish uh church of a house yeah it, is where freddie lives it would only make sense to this movie yeah i like that craven lives on the top of the you know whatever uh, hollywood hill with a big ass pool and all that other stuff. who knows if these are real i assume they went in, on location it's not anybody's real place but um, sure I think they're trying to imply here that this creature is so old that it dates back to, you know, like, cause it looked like it was, you know, some kind of Greek or Roman, um, environment, you know? Yeah. Um, that, you know, some kind of, um, oh, and, and there's drawings, there's drawings on the wall of like old, like dog demons and shit. Like, yeah, they are really trying to, uh, play up the ancientness of, freddy yeah but they're also grafting on the story of hansel and gretel where there's basically an oven that the kid crawls into and we get freddy krueger with the giant tongue you know attack thing that you know he does right. we get stre- yeah for. we get stretching arms and giant tongues and stuff we get like freddy's there he's in here yeah and they're able to eventually like push him into the uh the oven and blast him alive with fire because fire is the thing I guess that kills that Freddy Krueger is afraid of, right? right. At least the, it's the screen version. Odd, odd that he lives in a place with so much fire if he's that afraid of it. Yeah, right. Kind of odd, Freddy. Maybe <laughs> that's his uh, uh, hell, a prison of his own making. Maybe that's yeah, part of his demon. Yeah, it's like um, it's like uh, Darth Vader living on Mustafa, right? Like yeah. sure, the, lava, the lava made him into Darth Vader, so like 
you know, he's got to conquer it by like surrounding himself with it, I guess. Right. Become one with it. It destroyed me, but now I will control it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's um, there's a lot of unfortunate CGI mat work in this that always kind of distracts me every time that I watch it. Overhead shots that are uh, very, very, very fake looking and very 1990s. Um, yes. It does have a 90s flavor to it. Yeah. But I guess they are able to defeat the demon. And uh, much like the, the heroes of Hansel and Gretel, they end up back in their home and, uh, you know, uh, they're safe. But the uh, We're reading a story. Yeah. So tell me about this. So, like, yeah, how does the movie end? What's the what are they reading? Well, they uh, they fall out of the bed after defeating Freddy. And next to them is Wes's finished script with a note to Heather saying, thank you for playing Heather one last time. And so they grab the script and they start from the beginning. At the end, we go back to the beginning. They're reading the narration over the beginning scenes that we saw earlier. Yeah, so to the, end our the movie's story. a loop, right? It's yep. like in the mouth of madness or whatever. It's like it's going to start over again. Uh, it's yeah. a self-contained thing. I do like there's Until several scenes where they actually you see script pages or dialogue. She meets with Wes Craven, and that scene ends with like they had to, they had the conver the conversation that they had he had written out already. Uh, yeah. You know, on on the screen with a fade to black, which is kind of nice. yeah. And then, then we fade to black. Uh, yeah. and at the end, the same thing happens where they kind of look at like how does it end and. There's, you know, all the dialogue that they're about to say to each other. Um, is it a story? It is a story. Yeah. The story that contains, there's another one that we have to contain that horrible, horrible human violence and fear. Until <laughs> next time. Until next time. Um, well, I guess any uh, stray observations before we head off to mailbag and our wrap ups? I don't think so. Okay. All right. So <laughs> we just now, all look at each other weird. Okay. Well, what we're going to do, we're going to look at each other even weirder as we review and tell you whether or not you should watch an, uh, Wes Craven's new nightmare. But before we do that, ladies and germs, we're going to read some of your mail. And in order to do that, we're going to have to summon our mailman. And his name is Igor. Bring us the mail. Masters, masters, the mail. I've got the mail. So many letters. Our followers are rising, rising. Why, thank you, Igor. Hey, thanks, Igor. Did you live in like a like a crusty dungeon with fire everywhere? I feel like there's less fire there. More I think goo. He would get burned. More goo, less. Yeah, he would get burned a lot. So I think less fire. Yeah, he does leave but, like a snail trail behind him. So yeah, that makes sense. So, uh, who knows if that's flammable? I don't know. <laughs> he, he could just be leaking flammable liquids. It's possible. Well, we want to remind you how you can participate in this interactive portion of our show. We'd love to hear from you. All you got to do is follow along on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Saturday Night Freak Show. Or you can follow along on Twitter. At Sat Freak Show. Or maybe emails your game. You can email us. Saturday Night Freak Show at yahoo.com. Or you can follow along on Instagram at Saturday Night Freak Show. Oh, MF Mad, the keeper of the Saturday Night Freak Show Wall of Fame, also wants us to know that Rob LaBelle has made it to the Wall of Fame. And you're like, who the hell was Rob LaBelle? Well, you will recognize it, wait, him. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on. Is it the is the PA? He was a special effects guy. Damn it. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. He was okay. on the on Chase's uh, Cut to the Chase uh, crew, uh, Terry... Uh, and I can't remember who the other guy was. So and so and Terry. Uh, he was also in Jack Frost, which we did on the show. He was a character named Stone, and he was in a movie that you will not believe that we covered on Saturday Night Freak Show. That was Hot Tub Time Machine. <laughs> but he was in that too. Uh, the Although old days. for me, for some reason, I always remember him from Watchmen. I don't know. That's the face huh. here. I remember from watching. Anyway, uh, about Wes Craven's new nightmare, Stephen Haynes writes in and says, "My favorite movie." In the Nightmare on Elm Street series is this one. I loved Freddy's new makeup and returned to a more darker tone while still giving us a peek behind the Hollywood curtain in a kind of pseudo reality. Yep. Travis Legler says, this is an amazing movie. I love seeing Robert England play goofy Freddy on the talk show, then play dark Freddy. And at the end, when Heather hits him in the face and yells, fuck you. Oh, I love this movie. <laughs> I can't fucking wait for your review. Awesome choice. <laughs> It, uh, thank you. Uh, it is a nice <laughs> dynamic. <laughs> it is a nice dynamic that we do get, uh, quote unquote, old Freddy at the beginning of this movie. That is nice to have that in there. 
Uh, Robin Linneman Silverberg writes in and says, everyone seems to love this one, but it left me pretty ambivalent, but I haven't liked a Freddy movie since number three. I well, think this you, movie's pretty divisive. I'm going to say this movie's divisive. I see a lot of both. All right. Well, Michael Whitaker says, we're reaching a time when I stopped being afraid of horror movies, and I remember seeing the commercial for this and thinking that mechanical Freddy Krueger looked cool. Hmm. <laughs> Uh, J- <laughs> Jacob Law says, I love this version of Freddy. He was legitimately scary for the first time since part one. I love the movie, but it would have been better if r- it was Robert Eng- England being haunted. That would, I, I didn't, That'd I never so thought cool. about that. Right. I never thought about that until they mentioned it in this, in this comment. I'm just like, damn it. We didn't get a, a Robert England versus Freddy thing. And yeah. that is, that is the, that is the one downfall. I will say that I have with this movie. It's just like, ah. Oh, we could have demon. It. it could be like Highlander. The demons like there can only be one. You're the false prophet. I'm going to kill you. You know, right. like, we killed everybody else. Why couldn't we kill Robert Englund? Yeah. Right. Oh, wait. <sighs> when was when last action me? hero? Ninety three. Boom. I'm telling you, some kind of meta shit going on in Hollywood at this point in time <laughs> where this is where Hollywood ate itself. <laughs> right. <laughs> Now we've figured out the magic. That's because uh, Jack Slater and Arnold Schwarzenegger. Right. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I, th- I think we're. I, I think I'm coming down to narrowing down the magic year in the '90s, Colin. I'm not there yet, but I think I'm coming down to it. So I'll, a little more research has to be done, <laughs> but I think I'm getting there. Okay. Stay uh, tuned. Simon Carter says, "I always liked this movie. Some solid performances from the main cast, and it was a pretty cool idea to change things up in the franchise. The earthquake story is kind of crazy too." Yeah especially considering how the real life events played in yes uh matthew ola says i just watched it last week i thought it was good but super meta obviously obviously and dj malika says i can't wait for this one i know fans are divided on it but i've always appreciated it for going outside the box i wish they would have also done something with peter jackson's idea for part six he says if you don't know what that is it's absolutely worth a google cheers I looked it up. It was oh. A Nightmare on Elm Street 6, The Dream Lover. Oh, so Freddy has sex. Uh, I didn't get that Gross. far into it. I was like, it had something to do with like kids are going into the dream world so they can pick on Freddy because he's got no power. And I don't know. You have to look it up. Ooh, Peter Jackson. A reverse. <laughs> yeah. He, I was uh, going to say, I'm not, I'm not up to this. Uh, I'm not up for hearing this idea. But once I heard it, I'm just like, okay. Yep. As long as Peter Jackson doesn't direct, I'll be fine. You know that there would be a version of the song Dream Lover put in that movie somewhere at some point, too. Probably over and over and over mm-hmm. and over again. Yeah. Um, about last was, week. Dr- wait, was Dream Weaver ever used in any of the the no. <laughs> Elm Street movies? Come no. on. Why couldn't somebody pay for that? <laughs> because that guy's a pedophile, so I don't think people want oh. to license his music anymore. Well, there's that. Um, last week we watched a movie called Nomads. B movie poster vault wrote in and says, I have several questions. What we in the too. name of Q's wrinkled butt is Nomads? Q because Pierce Brosnan, James Bond is in the movie. Okay. Yep. Uh, he says, Why does the poster I found online have Pierce Brosnan blasting a laser out of his crotch? <laughs> Why is he dressed like he stole John Travolta's disco outfit? And where do I watch this right now? Mm, we have answers for all those questions except the last one i wish i had answers for any of it you know yeah Mm. michaela's the one who wants the answers real bad yeah she got she got stiffed on that one i got got misled misled by an amazing poster and a well-cut trailer (laughs) and by now b movie poster vault we hope that you've listened to our episode before you've decided to see the movie um uh previous uh, week we watched a movie called dracula 2000 and uh, or sorry no last week we did shivers sorry and then no man oh, dracula yeah, 2000 happy l says uh, about dracula 2000 i watched it the other night with the tv sound off and i played your podcast at the same time and it synced up fairly well and was pretty fun oh nice <laughs> That's awesome. I hope we awesome. didn't. I hope we didn't ruin the like big reveal for you if you hadn't seen it before. Well, we we <laughs> delayed it on that episode. I was listening to it again. Yeah. Like, yeah. Okay. So good, it probably good. timed up with. <laughs> yeah, right. um, okay. So now we're gonna go around the table. and We're gonna tell you what we thought of tonight's movie, A Nightmare, or Wes Craven's New Nightmare, starting with Alan. Alan's going first tonight. What did you think of Wes Craven's New Nightmare? Oh boy, hot seat. Um. Hot seat. Yeah, I keep on complaining about 90s horror movies, but this is actually one that I like. <laughs> um, <laughs> I guess I did. I like that it was such a drastic departure from 
the Nightmare on Elm Street series, which had gone kind of, you know, long in the tooth. It was like, okay, it's the same movie basically every time in the last one. Uh, Freddy's Dead, I didn't care for it. was The tone of it was so uh, off-putting to me. I guess campy maybe would be the word for that. Um, so this was kind of like... Um, like I said, I think I see this as the conclusion of a three part, you know, uh, it's the Nancy Thompson storyline, even though, you know, basically we get there by the end of this, but, um, I don't know. I, I appreciate what, uh, what, uh, Craven's trying to do here. Like I said, I think he's more successful, um, at, uh, uh, underscoring the point than Carpenter was with, um, in the mouth of madness. Um, but I find it ironic that um, um, Alex Zaja, the French director who did the remake of The Hills Have Eyes, said that when he was doing that movie and Wes Craven was a executive producer on it, that there's a scene in that film, you know, involving uh, one of the mutants like goes in and like, you know, kills a bird in a cage that was in the original movie and uh, Jean wanted to do it for the sequel or, you know, for the remake. And Craven was really had a problem with it, I guess. and was trying to come up with trying to encourage him to do something else. And as Jean was asking him like, you know, okay, so what's, I don't get it. You know, you were the master of shock. You made last house on the left and some of the, you know, a, a grisly fucking movie and a nightmare on Elm street. You know, you go back and watch that movie now and it's like, it's very disturbing, you know, and a lot of it goes extreme. I mean, like, you know, n- you know, you always think like, yeah, nightmare on Elm street. It's just one of those, movies but it's an extreme horror movie i think uh you know when you yeah. go back and watch uh, T- it tina tina in that body bag with all the blood has always felt like a like an extreme version of a death like that is it's fucked up yeah like, that's extreme yeah it's gory and bloody and violent and uh yeah i mean it pulls no punches um but, you know, I guess that was what Aja was saying that, you know, Craven had softened so much over the intervening years that he didn't want to do anything that somebody could uh, go out and, and duplicate, you know. So he obviously was living with this. It's just kind of funny to me that in 1994, his whole thing was like, no, horror movies purge the soul, right? Uh, they, you know, they they keep the the bad stuff at bay. It's not spilling out onto the streets because we've got horror movies, right? right? Everybody watches horror movies. And so there's not a whole lot of real life crime and violence. I'm like, well, you know, but um, uh and it's funny that he, you know, I don't know if he came around and, you know, to the opposite side of that, uh, you know, right. by I mean, 2006, you know. <laughs> sure. I mean, well, especially when I think when you're younger, you have more of a, it, or it seemed like Craven did at the time, more of a, um, a, a more of an uh, attitude at the beginning, because especially since he was doing stuff that he wasn't um, like exposed to or let allowed to have earlier on in his life. <clears throat> Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, I don't know. He's an interesting cat. I think we've said before, every time we bring up Wes Craven, the fact that he like reinvented or defined the horror genre in, or helped help define the horror genre at least three times over in three different right. eras, you know, in his life had these massive hits, you know, last house in the, in the seventies, uh, nightmare on Elm street in the eighties and scream in the nineties. I mean, that's like, I don't know that anybody else has done it with that successfully financially successfully and culturally successfully right. as, uh, as he has done, um, and he defined, like, I guess, uh, you know, the, the other reason why I was saying about, like, his um, version of what a dream is, <clears throat> you know, that kind of that bleed. He does the bleed of dreams where, you know, um, it's maybe lifting from, like, Rosemary's Baby, you know, had a dream sequence Polanski did that, like, that feels like, a you know, how you dream. Uh, whenever I watch that, I'm like, that feels like a dream I've had. Not the specific imagery or anything, but, you know, just the, <laughs> the way it works. Um, and then David Lynch, I think also like kind of defined a certain type of cinematic, uh, dream language set. Yeah. And Wes Craven has another one and his is almost in some ways, I think it's like Lynch and, and Craven, uh, their version of what movie dreams are is like, you know, that's basically what you see. A character's awake and then all of a sudden they're dreaming and, you know, um, I don't know if I'm giving him too much credit, but you know, whatever, that's my observation there. But as far as this movie goes, yeah, I think uh, if you can get away or get away from uh, some of the bad 
bad CGI and look at like what they're actually going for here. It's not perfect, but I mean, it's a lot more intelligent, clever, and uh, you know, it's a, it's a better experience than you get from a lot of his contemporaries. He's a thoughtful guy that Wes Craven. That's right. We just we, did Swamp Thing like a couple weeks right. ago. Oh, they so are doing we another. Did. Yeah. Um, would you, would so, you say it's hip, scary, and entertaining talent? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not going to say oh, that. Okay. All it's, right. Fine. That's just awful. So I'm going to I'm going to say you definitely should check out uh, Wes Craven's new nightmare. So that means we're going to go with Michaela next. What did you think? of tonight's feature film. You know, I think it's a really, really ballsy concept. And then I think it's even more ballsy how much they committed to it. And so I have a lot, a lot of, of res- I have a lot of respect for Wes Craven. It just for not only pitching this, but like not tiptoeing around it really straight going for it head on to the point that you're going to give Bob Shay like 10 lines of dialogue, you know, that's <laughs> Bob Shay gets a conversation. In this yeah. Movie. That's a, that's a bold strategy. And I think for, for this movie, it paid off. And I don't think a studio or filmmaker nowadays would ever try anything this risky, like, because movies now are all about, what can generate more money and propel us into a money-making machine. And I think this, there's something finite about this movie and um, it, it like you can't build a franchise on this. You know what I'm saying? You can't have a franchise of Freddy continually right. coming back into the real world. So, so like that alone, a studio would just see as a huge fucking risk nowadays and would never do it. So like, it's not only Wes Craven saying, I'm going to do it my way, but I'm going to end it my way, which I really like. Um, and it was really good to see him and see him on screen again. It made me a little sad though, too. Like I, it made me kind of miss the dude. Cause he has such like a gentle and calm presence that like just feels very genuine. And I don't know, he has like a, like a grandfather energy, you know, that I really like. And yeah, that I, grandfather I, that will murder you at some point. <laughs> yeah, and like, I don't know. It was good to see him on screen. He is a way better actor than Bob Shea, which is like good for you. You know, he, I feel like he <laughs> sold his scenes pretty well. Um, as much as I don't like, you know, like some of the choices they did with Freddie and stuff, I I mean, I still really like it. I still think there's a lot to like about this movie. I just think the concept is so good. And I think it's probably the best you can get for this kind of concept. I don't think you could really pull it off any better. I I do wish that Heather Langenkamp and like the Nancy character were a little more like a Laurie, Laurie Strode level of importance and like horror history you know like i wish she was up there and i think heather langenkamp is good and i wish like she had a better career too you know um and but you know they only gave her you know three movies ish you know in this whole franchise so um and that i think that's a problem i have with this franchise it's like i don't know why i'm okay with it in friday the 13th that you have like different people every movie and i'm not okay with it in nightmare on elm street i don't know i don't know what the difference is there but it just doesn't work for me as much with these movies and yeah i I really liked it even though i had some issues with it i can see why people wouldn't like this movie you either buy the concept or you don't you know uh my husband was not not into this concept at all he was not buying it and he was like i don't like how meta this is i don't this just isn't working for me and i was like but like i like it because it's it's not super freddy it's not the nuns it's not the dream child like i like that it is getting a little grounded and not being so stupid, you know? So I would recommend it. I think you're either going to love it or hate it. There's no in between, like it's going to work for you or it's going to not. And I think just by hearing the the premise alone, you'll be able to make that call if it's right for you, but I would definitely recommend it. Sean. Um, uh, What would be the equivalent today? Giving, uh, putting Jason Blum in uh, uh, like giving him a plum (laughs) part in a movie about him. Like, well, the last we, like reality think, warping movie is like a Spike Jones movie or something, right? right like, like, yeah, I don't. We can't. I don't think we can get away with that like that often. And like you said, yeah, this was you know it is a big risk. It's, you're making Wes Craven and Heather Langenkamp your main characters for a little while, and not giving yourself friendly. Um, this movie is. I mean, like we discussed, I I like the character of Freddy. I like certain things that he has done over this franchise, um, but I do like that in this movie. It felt like a, uh, I'm going to use a lot of cliches here, uh, uh, return to form, back to basics. But it really feels like they got down to, or they tried to get down to, uh, your 
results may vary, but they, they tried to get down to like the back to the base of what Freddy is. I mean, they do that with um, the actual character. They do that when Wes is kind of describing the entity that it is like it's, it's, it's basic evil that has taken a form. We give a little backstory to it, which I think there's a lot of things in this movie that I'm very forgiving of because it is a behind the scenes Hollywood movie. Like if any of these other explanations came through in quote unquote other normal straight horror movies, I think I'd be a little less accepting and believable of it. But for some reason, when we're talking about, um, you know, in this world, like I, I, in this movie, I give it leeway. Um, I love, like I said, I love a good Hollywood movie. I'm a sucker for it, good or bad. Like you show me the behind the scenes workings of like studios and stuff in Hollywood. I'm there for it. You give me a horror icon and you kind of go into that as well. I'm doubly there for it. I love the exploration of the character of Freddy. And I love that it's coming straight from Wes. Like not only is it written directed by him, but he's in the movie explaining those parts of it. He's telling you about those things. Um, and I, I kind of love that it's, it's coming from Wes um, considering this is, you know, one of his, like we said, one of his biggest contributions to the horror world. Um, and so when we get to this one, um, I think it really gives it an impact. Um, I, other things about this movie, I mean, I like the, um, the serious tone of it. Again, the serious tone, the violence, um, it, it's, a, it's a plus for me. Um, I think everybody's doing a pretty good job acting. I love the stuff with Heather and Robert. It's kind of like a dream if you're ever a fan of the, the Freddy series to see all this stuff happening. Um, I like his theme of stories and the power that they can, the power they have and what they can do. And I think that comes across really well in this movie. Um, I like this a lot also because it's a progenitor to like the Scream series as well. Like it's got a lot of those elements that I really like. Like I said earlier, I think the, the most probably one-to-one -one comparison is Scream 2. Again, with uh, one of my favorite horror movies. Um, and, you know, for those reasons alone, like, I, I absolutely recommend this movie. I love this Freddy. I like, you know, uh, Jokey Freddy 2. Uh, not as much, obviously, since I haven't revisited too much. But I think what they do with this character and the arc they show, like Colin said, from like 1, uh, one to 5 to 7, or 1 to 3 to 7, um, I think it's really good. I like that this kind of, it's a good end for the character as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, I definitely think you should watch it. Uh, it's one of the best in the series, as far as I'm concerned. So, yes, I recommend Wes Craven's New Nightmare. All right, so that's Freak Show approved. That's all three of us who's telling you you got to go watch it. If you haven't seen it already, there's something wrong with you. Uh, so, <laughs> next week, we're going to watch a movie that's chosen by... Holly. Holly? Holly? Holly, what are we watching next week? Um... We're going to watch the movie that I chose. It's called... <laughs> oh, I thought maybe she had told you guys. Okay, so it's going to be... She told me. Oh, she, she did? She told me, I know. Oh, okay, here we go. We're going to watch The Others. The in 2001. Nicole, Nicole Kidman. No, yes. no we're not. Okay. We're going to watch something else. <laughs> All right, so the next others. week we're watching The Others, the Nicole Kidman uh, classic. I don't know. We'll find out. No, we don't know. All right. Next, you all seen it, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I saw, I saw it once. Okay. All right. So that's next week on the Saturday Night Freak Show. We hope you'll join us. And until then, ladies and germs, the basement is going dark.